Hi there, everyone, and welcome to our four o'clock webinar series, Securing Your Business. Thank you for being here with us today. A few housekeeping comments before we get started. You'll find that this is a Zoom webinar, which means that you're automatically muted and that your video is disabled. We will have an opportunity, if time allows, at the end of this session for you to ask questions by raising your hand through the Zoom raise hand feature. I'll go over those details shortly, but just wanted to let you know that is the, um, that's the situation for today's Zoom call. You will also see on your screen a poll. We would love to have you take that poll and I'll be going over the results at the end of this call, um, just to be very careful with the doctor's time. So feel free to take that poll. If you see that popping up on your screen, you can hover on the bottom of your screen and click poll and cast your votes. We'd love to know how you personally are helping slow the spread of COVID-19. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So officially, thank you for being here and welcome. Each day, the Chamber of Commerce has been holding a webinar to help serve your business and your needs. We call this series our Securing Your Business series. And we've been covering topics from the financial impact, impacts of the current pandemic, the health situation, as well as how to manage your team remotely, and basically just finding ways to share practical content with you. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce has an ongoing mission to convene people and ideas, and when faced with this working from home situation, we found this is the best way to create a gathering place for our community to come daily, to find resources, and to be connected with important information that is, in, is changing in this crazy environment that we're living in. So today, I am so pleased to introduce our speaker. We know that our current hospitals are enduring a extreme crisis and are extremely busy. So we are so grateful to have the Chief Medical Officer and Vice President of Advent Health here with us today. Dr. Kebox is the, not only the Chief Medical Officer, but as I mentioned, also the Vice President. She serves as a part-time faculty for the Family Med Medicine Residency. She's worked for Advent Health for over 20 years and has a passion for women's health and hospital medicine. He is also the founder and executive vice president of the Advent Health Community Medical Clinic, providing care for uninsured patients in our community. Dr. Kiba is married to Dr. Williams, and, and they have five children, which is absolutely incredible. Dr. Kiba, thank you so much for being here with us today. We are excited to get some insights to what's going on in your hospital and some practical advice to cover COVID-19. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm happy to address any of the questions that you may have. Wonderful. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. We have asked our community to submit questions and I have a few that are ready for you. And okay. participants that are here on the call, um, we, we might have time for some additional questions at the end. So if you still have some, we'll, we'll open that at the very end for your questions. So Dr. Kiba, first question for you. What is the best thing that Winter Park citizens can do to help Advent Health right now? So the biggest help that we can, or the biggest thing that the community, community can do to help us here at Advent Health Winter Park is to practice social distancing and to stay home. So as this is becoming critically important as the numbers have increased um, to keep our workforce safe and um, to decrease the numbers and help flatten the curve. Thank you so much. And I hope that um, everyone on the call is doing that. I know that we are certainly advocating for that. We've been working from home for over three weeks and limiting all contact as much as possible. Um, so we hope that is helping. Um, okay, next question for you. New York is struggling to keep up with the number of cases. Do you think that your staff and facilities will be ready to tackle this when our cases begin to rise? Yes, we do. Um, we know that New York was one of the first cities that was affected with this virus and they are the epicenter for um, the US. We actually have been planning and working on um, preparing for this pandemic for more than four weeks. 
So we have invested a lot of infrastructure, technology, personnel, um, and we feel more than ready uh, for the surge should it occur here as planned. Well, that's amazing. That is so comforting to hear and to, to know about. Do you have any estimation of when we might see that peak of cases? I know that's a tough question to answer, but just a hypothesis or an estimate that you might have. Well, there's a few different models out there. And um, actually, the, uh, the models are based on how much social distancing is, is in effect, whether we have no social distancing or do we have 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent. So there's different models based on social distancing, but our best estimates based on the cases that we have and the rules that are in place right now uh, for the stay at home rule for the state is that we should see um, an increase or a peak of our cases in the end of April or the first week of May. Okay, okay, that's good to know, thank you. Um, and a question for you, this is kind of, overarching from all the questions that I have listed here are, but could you share with us an ideal situation of how someone would be social distancing right now? Like specific guidelines, like should you try to go to the store once per week? Should uh, we know to stay six feet apart? But are there any the guidelines that you could share of an ideal social distancing situation? Well, I know that the governor's made several recommendations and the CDC does as well. Um, unfortunately, I'm not practicing social distancing. I come to work every day at the hospital, so I'm not as familiar with the rules of social distancing, so I don't think that I'm the right person to give you an ideal state for social distancing, but we, we are recommending that as much as possible that you stay at home and you communicate electronically, that you order your, if you can, order your food on, online, have someone bring it to your home. Um, I, I, we are allowing folks to go out and exercise, though, as long as they're doing it like independently. So activities that are like running or, or um, even playing golf, but we're not recommending people participate in group activities like basketball or something like that. Perfect. And I did have a, a question come through. Um, this is from Stacy Stevens. I'm curious. Some people think that if you've been home for two or three weeks, it's now okay to visit with family and friends. What are your thoughts on that? We really are asking people to just stay home if they absolutely can. Now, I know that you may have a loved one that's older. Um, you want to protect that person, but you also may need to help them. I think it, it's certainly reasonable if you need to help an elder person in your, in your um, family, that would be reasonable. But we are recommending social distancing doesn't matter how long you've been doing it, we're to do it for 30 more days. So that's what we're recommending at this point. Perfect. Well, I appreciate that. Um, and I think that clarification is helpful because sometimes we don't know. We're like, oh, we've been home. We're, we're feeling safe. We're not, we don't think we're infected. And then, you know, we make different choices. Um, well, you know, you can be, um, you can be asymptomatic and still spread the virus. And even though you've been home for two weeks, you know, you, you still can come in contact with the virus with maybe you went to the grocery store, maybe, you know, the, the, the mail that you received because we know it can, it can be on surfaces for an extended period of time as well. Mm -hmm. Well, a question on the mail. Um, is there a practice that we should follow to sterilize those things? What is your recommendation? Should we spray them down or what should we do? <laughs> Uh, well, thankfully, a lot of people don't get mail anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, and we just, you know, practicing your hand washing. So if you're going to touch something that you think possibly could have been contaminated by someone who's been infected, just wash your hands before, touch it, don't touch your face, and wash your hands afterwards. Wonderful. Well, it seems like those simple instructions are really the cornerstone of everything that we should be doing right now. Um, you mentioned, we mentioned a little bit about going to the grocery store. I went this morning and I saw so many people with purchase masks as well as homemade masks. I'd love to get your take on how effective um, both of those methods are and what you would recommend that we, we do going forward. Well, I think that the, the homemade masks um, give a, when you wear a mask, you're actually protecting the other people you're not really protecting yourself. You're protecting other people. Um, so, and the homemade masks do help 
uh, with the limiting the spread of, of the virus. Um, as long as you are comfortable in that mask and um, you know you don't have, as long as you feel comfortable in that mask and you're you're able to breathe properly, then that mask would probably be safe for you to use. Um, you know the FDA um, approved masks have been tested. Um, the homemade masks have not been tested. Mm -hmm. So of course, you know the the hospital masks are are the ones that we are using in our hospital. Um, and the ones that we do recommend when we're taking care of patients that are ill. Perfect. Thank you for that clarification. And uh, a follow-up question in a way to that, could you speak to how the current situation of the PPE, the personal protection equipment at Advent Health is? What, what are you guys working with right now as far as the masks and gloves and the other um, equipment that you need? Oh, that's a really good question. So we do have, we have planned for the worst and you always hope for the best. So we have three levels of PPE. First is everything that's um, approved by the FDA that has been tested and shown to be, um, uh, works well against the virus. The second level is um, equipment that we believe to be effective that is manufactured um, but um, has not been tested fully yet. And then the third level is um, things that are homemade or locally made or manufactured. So we are still utilizing, we have plenty of our level one tier. So we're still using the um, FDA approved PPE in all of the Advent Health hospitals. We've made a significant investment. We have, uh, we have folks looking night and day to make sure that our equipment supplies are adequate and they're looking for new sources all the time. Um, a lot of resources have been directed to those states that are, um, that are having uh, more issues than us and that's completely appropriate, but we feel we have um, plenty of PPE for us. Well, that is very comforting to hear. Um, I'm so glad that you all are well stocked and have not only one uh, level, but three levels. Um, it sounds like you're very organized and ready, and that is wonderful to hear that you all are able to protect yourselves. Um, I have a question here about um, about the PPE, and I, I've, I've heard that it takes a lot of steps to actually fully protect yourself as when you're about to go um, speak with a patient. Are there, could you talk about what steps are included um, as far as putting on the mask, putting on a shield, gloves, et cetera? Um, like step by step, how, how do we do it or? Well, I, I have a question here about. Like uh, what do we do or what? Yeah, what, what do you, what do you what do? Level of protection. So, um, so for patients that um, are known to be COVID positive, um, we do wear gowns, we wear gloves, we wear eye protection and we wear masks. So those are the, the levels of protection. And the masks that we wear, um, there's two kinds of masks. Um, and one mask is called an N95, which um, uh, protects us against the smallest particles that, that are found in viruses. So for the most part, we feel that um, the surgical masks are protect us against droplets, and we feel that this is transmitted via droplet. So that means with a droplet, if you know, if you cough or sneeze, it falls to the ground usually within six feet of, of the person. And we feel that surgical masks are more than adequate. But if the patient is COVID positive, in an abundance of caution, we are using N95 masks, which really, which really um, protects the, the patient. I mean, I'm sorry, protects the, the healthcare provider. Wonderful. Thank you so much for answering that one. Okay, here's another question from the community. If my family member is hospitalized, what are the rules for visitation? So because, as I mentioned earlier, people can be um, asymptomatic and still carry the virus, either they are just an asymptomatic carrier or they're asymptomatic for one or two days before they become symptomatic. So because of that, we, are, we have restricted visitation um, for our patients in the hospital. There are some extenuating circumstances. So um, of course, pediatric patients, uh, we don't have those here at Winter Park, but at Orlando, um, you can have uh, one parent at a time uh, visit. And then um, our laboring OB patients, they're allowed to have one support person. Um, and then of course, um, our patients that are at end of life, they can have someone come in as well. 
Well, that's really wonderful to hear. Um, I know that there's all kinds of articles out about some of those limitations in other places, but it's really nice to know what's happening in our own community and hearing it from you as well. Um, okay, here's another question. How does the COVID-19 infection rate compare with other viruses like maybe the flu? So um, the, uh, COVID, the COVID virus appears to be more in, infectious. We have seen more of a, a higher uh, rate of infection than we had uh, predicted initially. Um, but it is a virus similar to the flu or there's the common cold. The common cold, when people say they have the cold, they have an, a, an infection with a respiratory virus. So it's very similar and that's why it's hard to tell if you have the flu or you have COVID based on your symptoms because there, there's a lot of uh, crossover. A lot of people have the same symptoms, fever, myalgias, um, cough, those kind of symptoms. So if you're, you or a loved one are experiencing some of those symptoms, they could look like a cold or flu, um, but of course you're nervous that it could be COVID-19, what protocols would you recommend as far as when to stay home, when to go try to get tested, or when to go to the hospital? So um, patients should, they can use, most patients, if they have access to a primary care physician, they can call their primary care physician and, and get advice over the phone. A lot of physicians are practicing telemedicine at this point. If they don't have a private, um, uh, private um, primary care physician, they can um, use an um, our e app, or we have a, an app on the phone called eCare. And, um, that is an app that you can log on and, and um, in your own home, see a physician virtually, like we're doing right now, who can assess your symptoms and your risk factors to determine if you need testing. Um, if, you, if you think you need to be seen and, and neither of those uh, options appeal to you, you can also go to um, an outpatient urgent care. If you're having symptoms of fever, cough, um, myalgias, those are the kinds of symptoms that you would normally have. You could either treat them at home with um, fluids and, and rest, um, or you can get tested. Um, previously, if you'd asked me this question two or three weeks ago, I would say if you have those symptoms, you probably should just stay home unless your symptoms worsen and then you should see your provider. However, we now are open to having, we have more test capabilities here in the area than we have had um, previously. So we are allowing people to get tested now, even with mild symptoms. And what, how that would help in the future is that patients that, that may have a mild case and resolve, they will have the antibodies against the COVID virus in the, in the future. And then um, we are doing, um, looking at treatment uh, with convalescent serum from people that have recovered from the virus. So, if let's say I had the virus and then I fully recover, um, I could donate blood, one blood, and they could use my blood to um, obtain the antibodies and provide those antibodies to someone who was um, in critical condition, who wasn't able to fight the, the virus with their own immune system. So it's um, so now at this point we are saying it is good to get tested even though you may not require treatment other than to be told to rest and drink lots of fluids and, and monitor your symptoms. Um, symptoms that would be concerning that we would want you to see to seek care in the emergency room would be symptoms of feeling um, short of breath, weak and dizzy, um, if you had um, chest pain, those kind of symptoms could mean that you have a more uh, symptomatic or progress progressive form of the virus. Okay, thank you so much for answering that in so much detail. I think it's really helpful to have those kind of benchmarks to know what you should do if you see those type of symptoms in yourself or in your home. Um, so thank you. We do have a couple of questions coming in um, from the audience, which I would like to take. Um, I will share with everyone on the call that we do have um, Dr. Kiba just for seven more minutes. So um, prepare your questions. I am ready to take your questions now. You can take, type them in the chat box. So if you hover on the bottom of your screen, 
click chat um, or click on the raise hand feature of Zoom. So it's just a little icon that says raise hand and you can find that at the bottom of your screen where the chat box is or um, on the bottom of the panel of the participants box. So I, I'll start with a couple of our um, live questions now. Um, okay, Dr. Kiva, we have a question about the number of nurses and doctors. Do we feel that we have the amount needed at your hospital to meet this critical demand, the future critical demand? So we've done a lot of things to prepare in advance for this pandemic. And one of the things that we have decreased is the um, elective procedures um, and surgeries. So. Um, we are kind of redeploying and repurposing some of our nurses and physicians that may work in different areas or fields um, to help us in the future um, should, we, should the need arise in, with an increase in the number of patients presenting with uh, COVID virus. So we feel like our numbers will be adequate. Okay, wonderful. Also, I will share, there's a note from Caitlin Janico. We love Dr. K, so oh. thankful for you. Oh, so sweet, thank you. <laughs> okay, another question. Um, this says, although there seems to be a flattening of the contagion curve, is it true that there will be just as many infections and deaths just spread over a longer period of time? So what the flattening of the curve does is that it allows us to have the resources to take care of the patients better. At this point in, in the curve, we have adequate um, number of, of uh, doctors, nurses, uh, ventilators, ICU beds. Uh, if, the, if we have a high volume and peak um, all at one time, resources may become tighter. Although we have planned um, and we have, we have ordered um, lots of supplies to prepare us for this. Um, it would be better if we could take care of our patients' business as usual. What that means is our usual ICUs, our usual physicians, and not have to extend um, using um, resources all throughout the hospital. With flattening the curve, we will be able to take care of more patients at this higher level of care and I think we can, um, it will uh, delay the time, allowing us to get better treatment. So there's a lot of uh, medications that are um, being investigated right now. This new convalescent serum that I was talking about from um, gathering antibodies from people who've had it. So if, if everybody got sick at once, then nobody's gonna have the antibodies. So the, um, the longer period of time, we're gonna be able to have more um, treatments available and we will have less debt with the flattening of the curve, absolutely. We may have the same number of cases, but, they, but we'll be able to better treat them with the resources we have, the medications, and the therapies that are coming out because we are, every day, we're learning something new about this virus. Thank you so much for really explaining that flattening of the curve purpose. I think that's really helpful to hear. Um, okay, we have a question from Stephanie Biddle. Are medical professionals at greater risk of bringing home the virus to their families? What can they do to help prevent that scenario? So medical professionals are at a greater risk because we are, um, exposed, we, are, we are exposed more often to patients that are COVID positive. Now we are taking every precaution um, to decrease our risk. We are fortunate in that at Advent Health, we have um, adequate um, PPE to protect ourselves. But, um, you know, as I mentioned, patients or family members may be asymptomatic and we may be um, exposed unbeknownst. Or, um, and so it is important that we, that we do take extra precautions. And one of those is to make sure that we take care of um, our clothing and um, our, the tools that we use at the hospital every day, our, um, our references, our, our stethoscopes, those kinds of things, just to make sure that we're, we're washing everything properly so that we don't bring what I consider, um, you know, possibly contaminated equipment or clothing into our home. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, one, what, we'll have two questions left. Um, one is, 
we're hearing about the PPE at, in the, that the hospitals are using, but then we're also hearing that if we wear them to the grocery store, it's protecting us. Um, can you speak to kind of the difference there? I'll read this question verbatim, if okay. that's okay. <laughs> we have been hearing that masks protect the other person, but healthcare workers are wearing masks to protect themselves from COVID-19 positive patients. Why is there this inconsistency? If that makes sense. Okay, it does. So, you know, it's really good if, if both people have a mask on, but at least if one person has a mask, they're protecting the other person. Um, so the, the masks, uh, you know, this is transmitted um, through the naso and oral pharynx. So the masks cover those areas, the nose and mouth. So um, what we're trying to prevent is in, in a situation where you're spending more than 10 or 15 minutes with a person within six feet, that like when I'm talking, um, possibly I could, you know, there could be some um, aerosolization of, of saliva in my mouth that's transmitted. So I am, so with the mask on, I'm preventing it from getting it to you. And with, if you have a mask on, it's preventing it from coming to me. And if you, if I only have the mask on um, and you don't, you could still contaminate my mask or my face places that are not protected and I could touch it and, and contaminate myself. Does that make sense? I think so. I think um, that does make sense. And thank you for answering that. I'm sorry, it was a tricky question for me to read to you. Well, um, I think we, you know, it, it I mean, in, in the perfect world, we would all have um, respirators that were 100% perfect and, and, but, you know, it's, you know, I think we do, I think that they're effective, um, but there's always, there's always room for um, things yeah. to happen. Absolutely. That are unexpected. Absolutely. Well, um, our last question is, how can we help? What do you need? And that came from one of our participants on the call. Is there anything we could do? Well, we really want you to practice social distancing. We've really seen a flattening of the curve since, since Friday. And um, it just seems like I think that people are hunkering down. They are uh, following the guidelines. Um, that's the biggest thing that we can do to help protect our workforce that is still going out every day. Um, and they're working and, and sometimes they're trying to support our, our restaurants too. So some of them are stopping at probably a drive through or whatnot. So um, it's good to protect our workforce by staying home so that, that our healthcare providers can be well enough to take care of you if you should have to come to the hospital. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Kiba, thank you so much for taking all this time to answer our questions. Uh, we so appreciate all the work that you're doing and the amazing job that Advent Health is doing here in our community. We're just so thankful to have um, such a wonderful partner. So thank you for being here. I know you have to hop off, so feel free to do so at any time. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the opportunity to share with you what we're doing. We're very proud and excited about all the work that we have done to prepare for this um, pandemic and um, we we are feel very blessed to have been in this community for um, over a hundred years so we feel like um, we're in this together and helping each other get through this thank you so much thank you dr. Kiba have a wonderful day and thank you for everything you do you too bye bye for everyone else on the call, I'll just wrap us up quickly. I want to thank you for joining us today and tell you a little bit about our upcoming items that we have. Um, we have two, two more um, Securing Your Webinar Series plans at this time. Tomorrow, we will have an attorney on to speak about navigating the landlord and tenant environment. So really learning of what to do if you're a business that may, may be struggling to pay rent right now. So be sure to join us there tomorrow. And then on Monday, we have a fun session with Chelsea Highland, who's going to talk about what we're calling permission to play, lessons for a pandemic through improv. It should be a really fun and engaging session, a way to take your mind off of what's going on and maybe find some ways to actually adapt. So thank you so much for being here, here with us today. We hope to see you tomorrow or at one of our future webinars. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Good night, everyone.